LaDonna Bravewell Allard, a Standing Rock Sioux elder, said, The U.S. government is wiping out our most important cultural and spiritual areas, and as it erases our footprint from the world, it erases us as a people. The North Dakota Access Pipelines, also known as No Dapple Protests, are a grassroots movement that began in spring of 2016 as a direct reaction to the approval of construction of Energy Transfer Partners Dakota Access Pipeline that would run through the Standing Rock Indian Reservation, contaminate their waters, and violate the sacred burial grounds of their ancestors. Throughout the course, we've talked a lot about No Dapple, and I think there's some interesting ties with Communitas, yeah. the kind of tenant of E.D. Turner. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so, um... No Dapple kind of came up beginning when we started talking about Communitas because um, we learned that like Communitas is like a presence and a feeling um, of like being united under one thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that with this, we're in the article with Amy Turner, we were talking a lot about it in the sense that Communitas is a positive feeling yeah. and it comes from positive virtualization and interaction. But one of the questions that I asked in class was like, could it also be protesting against something yeah. that people believe in? And I think that that's what we're seeing in um, Standing Rock, that like people really believe in this. They feel passionately that their rights and their land shouldn't be violated. And that's the feeling of Communitas that we're getting from seeing all the protesting and like hearing the words of protest from different people around the world. Yeah. And what's interesting too is that it's not just like one group of people in the sense of one tribe, but it's so many different people coming together that it kind of seems to be what Communitas is all about in the sense of uh, like finding a commonality and differences, you know what I mean? Yeah, and so like the Communitas, the feeling there, the presence there is overcoming all of the differences, all of like the inner tribe violence and all of the differences with people who aren't even Native American but are still very appalled by the violation of their lands. Um, all of those differences are overcome and forgotten in the feeling of Communitas. Yeah. And it's, it's really cool to be able to relate something from this course to something that's so prevalent that's going on in the world and constantly reported and we kind of get a more deep like a deeper understanding of that it's not just people are coming together period it's people are experiencing communitas and yeah. that's cool of under that's a cool way of understanding this yeah during the course we talked about communitas in um different senses and one was brought up by tanya lerman um where she talks about ritual and um, communitas without a deity and a focus for um, kind of worship. Instead, communities would come together and you would have this feeling brought on by the ritual and it would motivate you and get into a certain mood, but it's not necessarily a, um, a worship of sorts. And so I think there's a quote um, by Tanya Lerman. And, uh, the quote says, rituals change the way that we pay attention as much as perhaps more than they express belief. So um, when we referred to Gertz earlier in the semester, we talked about how you know ritual kind of related to symbols and uh, actually motivations as well. So I, I believe we can make a connection between the two. Right, There's, um, so the motivation of all of these tribes coming together. In our research, we found 500 tribes came together, all of these tribes with like past mm -hmm. disputes, um, tribal wars, and they've all come together under one goal, one motivation to um, make this movement in the world and um, to inspire people and to just bring this ritual um, together. And the tribes are talking about the black snake, which is a representation, a symbol, mm -hmm. um, for um, harming Mother Earth, is what they say. Mm -hmm. um, this is poisoning the people, poisoning the land. And the black snake is the oil that's coming across the land. Um, they extend this symbol within the tribe on this small amount of land. Mm -hmm. They extend it across the US through all cultures mm -hmm. as a, they say, um, the black snake represents unemployment for, um, impoverished people, not just um, Native Americans, but also um, any ethnic group, anyone that's um, oppressed and discriminated against. They, um, they say it's an, um, for unhoused people, under education across the country. It's just what is affecting the people and 
polluting our education system, our development, our children, and the generations to come. I think another interesting thing to think about in this context is kind of the duality that exists almost within the different groups because a lot of what we've been looking at is the Native American point of view and just the other people who want to protect the earth, but it's also important to keep in mind that there are the corporations, there's kind of the business side of this, and all those that actually support the pipeline. Yeah. And with that in mind, it kind of makes me think about the Rain Doctor article we read, because it talks about how there's this medical doctor who goes to a foreign country with his kind of preconceived notions about the way that nature works, and then finds out that there are others who have entirely different ideas, and it's just hard for him to adjust to that, because he thinks he knows what's right. So it's like, Maybe the, the corporations think they know what's right, like they think that their idea of having the pipeline is the best thing, where the Native Americans or the others believe something else. So there's just this constant like duality going on. Yeah, and so that was like the Livingston or the Livingstone article. And I do think that that's important because like the brain doctor, the other doctor they looked at they were looking at the same thing. They were both studying medicine, but they just saw it in two completely different ways. And I think that that might have to do with like your your like position within culture and within society and things like that because the Native Americans are looking at this pipeline and they see it as a violation of their lives, of Mother Nature and Mother Earth. Um, and I also think, you know, in the same sense, we do have to look at how the corporations are thinking of it. They're thinking, you know, we're trying to make money for the economy, we're trying to fuel jobs, we're trying to, you know, get more natural resources, things like that. So even though in our, from our social position, we might feel like this is a completely you know, wrong that they're doing upon the Native Americans and this is so unfair and we should protest it, somebody looking at it from a business sense might see it, it completely differently. And yeah. I also think that has to do with, you know, the way different people view progress. So the Native Americans see this pipeline as like a deterrent for progress because mother, with a, if we're damaging Mother Earth and we're not progressing, in fact, we're moving backwards. Yeah. But the corporations see it as like, we're making more money, we're creating more jobs, we're getting more resources so we don't have to be dependent on foreign allies, things like that. So I think that that's a breakdown in how they view progress. Yeah. The different perspectives and stuff like that. Yeah. That was a really good article to read and figure out, you know, that there are multiple perspectives that you yeah. do have to consider when dealing with an issue like this. Yeah, definitely. And in the same context of people reacting differently, where in the other instance it was people from kind of both sides of the argument reacting differently, I think there can also be differing opinions kind of within the same group. So it makes me think of the um, Ghana slave trade article we read in the sense that there were the kind of the greater category of people who were affected by slavery, but within that category people responded in very different ways. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of shows that not everyone is going to react to something exactly the same, you know? Yeah, and I think that, you know, that's the result of, you know, being connected to what actually happened in the past, you yeah. know, that culture that was expressed there. So, uh, you know, making a connection between the, you know, the, what happened in Ghana and what's happening right now with the Native Americans. You know, the government and, you know, this private oil company, they're not connected. They're not connected to the land of the Native Americans, you know, that they, you know, express so many feelings and emotion for simply because they don't have any history there. They, yeah. they don't have, they don't bury the ancestors there. They don't rely on the resources and the water there. So uh, uh, that, this kind of connection I made from the housing reading to yeah. uh, the current, you know, yeah. pipeline uh, situation. Yeah. And I think it's interesting to think about kind of a like collective memory too, you know, because you could think of like the African Americans who go back to Ghana and they have this kind of long history of the slave trade and how it affected their family like generations up. And then you think of the Native, Amer Native Americans at Standing Rock who have been affected just like year after year by the kind of American government as a whole. So it's been like ingrained in them through time. So they have like a, a memory that stretches hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. And uh, you know, being that it goes back, go back so many years, I mean, the, going to uh, 500 different tribes, you have different ways that you're gonna express how you, your opinion and how you're gonna express how you feel about the situation. Like we have some people at Standing Rock who are physically there, you know, uh, you know, fighting and, you know, being abused and, you know, taking this, you know, physical abuse from, you know, the government and police. Or mm -hmm. well, we have some who, choose to express themselves through social media and the internet and uh, just so many different takes on it. Um, I feel like, you know, just, you know, being that there's so many different tribes across, you know, you know, wherever the pipe is, you know, going to be established, uh, you know, 
that just gonna, that's going to continue to bring the different tribes together. Uh, just like in Ghana, in Ghana like it's the, the expression of tourism is kind of just separating those who you know who have history there versus the people who want to you know kind of you know be able to feel this, you know kind of same yeah you know you know you know what yeah. I'm saying trying to feel the same expression and you know feeling and vibe that yeah. pe the ancestors who were there hundreds of years ago uh, got to express and feel so that's kind of my take on it yeah. Albert Einstein said that the world is a dangerous place to live, not because of the people who are evil, but because of people who see evil and don't do anything about it. Yeah, and I think that that quote is important to what we're talking about with the Dakota Pipeline, because there's all these people on the ground who are going and protesting and using their voice and fighting against the evil that they feel is being done to Mother Nature and on like and to the Native Americans. And on the other end of that, um, corporations are fighting for their right to build and to you know make money and things like that and so even they are using their voice even though a lot of people feel like they're the ones in the wrong but then there's all of these people who fall in the middle who know that what's going on is wrong but aren't using their voice to speak out and i think that that's what the quote is getting at that it's not okay to just be a bystander like if you see something is wrong in the world then you should stand up for that and in this case it would be standing up for native americans and their rights and standing up for their values um, and how they feel that water is sacred and how they feel like their lands are sacred, which is something that should be respected because it's part of their culture and their history. There's definitely a, um, a problem between our human rights values and the control that something like money has over these corporations and over officials in our country and our government. Um, for those who contribute to the economy with all this money for an energy source, for the oil, um, you can't really go against them if they're part of your system. And so it's a huge stance to have to stay by your values and stick up for the human rights of these individuals, of the Native Americans. Um, and you find that with um, people in power like Obama and Hillary, you, have, you find them making statements that kind of just have to take a neutral stance on this because yeah. they can't go against people that are contributing to their economy and who they have stock in mm -hmm. but at the same time a lot of their values that they've t told to us and that we elected them for was to stand by the people and to stand up for these people who don't have a voice yeah so it's kind of like this dichotomy between you know using your voice um, and then there's people who have more powerful voices than others and they're not using their voice properly to stand up against evil and I think a lot of people are very disappointed with the way that our political leaders have dealt with this. So this is George, and so far we've been talking a lot about the anthropological point of view of Standing Rock in that whole situation, and we kind of wanted to get away from that and get a point of view that's outside of that realm. So if you could just tell us about what you've been hearing, how you feel about it, stuff like that. So I think a lot of my knowledge about the um, No Dakota pipeline issue comes from social media. Um, I think one of the best things about being in a collegiate environment as well is having a group of people who are extremely passionate, very, very, you know, informative and knowledgeable group of people who have chosen to take up a cause that's bigger than themselves um, that comes in the North Dakota pipeline issue. Um, I think recently, too, as a politics major, it's become something that's very politicized as well. You can't discuss American politics without discussing the issues that are personal to um, the American populace, and this is one of them. Um, it's the perfect mix of you know politics and economics. Um, just being able to see how strongly a group of people feel about an intrusion of a corporate influence in their homeland is very important as well. Um, I think personally it's something that appeals to me because I've always wanted to see how moneyed interests and um, economics come into play with people who may be you know, socially disadvantaged. I think history hasn't necessarily been kind to the people that this issue offends. And it's always interesting to see how willing um, an American government is to take up their cause or go against it. So uh, um, it's definitely an interesting issue and something that's caught my eye through social media and other means. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Another critical issue and something very important to the Native Americans in um, Standing Rock is the uncovering of ancient burial grounds which are sacred to the people. They have a connection with the dead 
that um, ties back kind of to what we were learning in Dancing of the Dead where the preservation of bones, of skeletons, is kind of a tie to the spiritual world. They, um, they talk about how coming together as a community, unifying, they think that their prayers connects them with the spirits of their ancestors and through prayer their ancestors will come and stand with them and actually really influence this fight. Um, so if this cannot go on, it's a losing battle in their minds. They need their ancestors, they need the support and power that they get out of that. So if you're uncovering burial grounds mm -hmm. which connect the spirit of their ancestors to this world and to um, the people, then you're disrupting this whole movement and something that they hold sacred. Right. And you were telling me this is similar to something that happened on the West Coast that you had heard about. Yes, uh, University of California in 1990, there were um, skeletal remains of Native Americans found on their campus. And um, it brought up the Native American graves protection and repatriate, uh, repatriatic um, act of 1990 and what it does is um, it allows Native Americans to continue to possess uh, possess their remains of their ancestor, uh, ancestors and um, if anyone like the government were to try to uh, you know come in and take them or use them for um, museums is what, exactly what they try to do um, in the U University of California in 1990. You know, it gives Native Americans the right to uh, you know keep their ancestral remains being that they, you know it, it refers back to their history and their, their culture. So um, they this act is still in um, effect today. So, um, you know, the, the 500 tribes that are, you know, involved in this situation, they have the right to, you know, you know, uh, to play this card of the, the Repatriation Act simply because, you know, there's plenty of grounds that may be dug up for the pipeline that may involve or possess, you know, skeletal remains of their ancestors. So this this is a, a, also a concern that they will present in courts or in the future, um, depending on if the pipeline will be laid or not. Right. It's something that um, we as a people, we don't understand a lot of their spiritual connection to the, to the remains, which have to be buried properly and cared for properly or else they cannot connect to the spirit world, which is something we were introduced to in The Dancing of the Dead, where it kind of seemed like something we couldn't imagine, but it was very important to the people there. And we just have to understand that we don't understand that side of them. And they believe that now, just because the, fact, the body and uh, you know, the exterior, you know, physical presence of the body is gone, the soul still represents as, you know, a firm presence presence of the family. So the Native Americans of these 500, 500 tribes that are participating in this protesting of the act, they feel like they're supported by their ancestors as well simply because they, their souls are still present, not uh, just because their bodies aren't here to protest, um, protest with them, mm -hmm. they, they still feel like they have the background support and you know support of their ancestors exactly. because they were properly buried and they were able to participate with their ritual rituals and you know um, you know, they would continue to doing consistent tri uh, rituals throughout the many years and hundreds of years that they were, uh, you know, can doing this. So uh, they're gonna play this card of the act, and they're gonna continue to practice their rituals with the bodies and the souls, and they're gonna have that support system behind them. Chase Iron Eyes, who is one of the leaders of the No Dapple movement, quoted one of his elders, and he said, "This is the bow and arrow that is directing this country towards justice." And this is the camp that is moving the arrow in that direction, but you have to believe. And that made me think a lot about the Stalking with Stories uh, reading that we read during class, in the sense that the stories kind of represented an arrow that was directed at someone, and as you told them that story, it kind of hit them and stuck with them in the same sense that an arrow does. And I think these ideas relate together because as people are receiving this message of the injustices done to the Native people, it's hitting them like an arrow and sticking with them, and then it's also spreading through all forms of communication. And I think that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, and I think going along with that, um, the way in which the story is told, so, you know, the arrow can shoot at you and it can miss if 
the story isn't told in a sense that you can, in a way that you can connect with, or if the story is told in an unauthentic way. So um, I think we were, you know, as we were discussing this issue, we were talking about the different ways in which we've experienced this. So a lot of us have seen it through social media, and we've seen um, videos of people weeping and protesting and things like that. But then we also get this very like mainstream media view of it, where it's just the simple facts and you take away the emotion and you make it more of just like a factual thing, you know, the treaty says this, and the people feel this way, the corporations feel this way, period, the end, like the pipeline is gonna be moved, period. But then, you know, we go on social media or we go to YouTube and we see these videos and we see the emotion behind it and that's an arrow that strikes us. So I think that looking at, um, you know, how storytelling is important to understanding or even empathizing with the issue is part of what we learned in this course and part of how we're making sense of this. And I think another thing that's so important with those stories is that because they so often deal with the landscape and they kind of bring you back to that place, it kind of mirrors what's going on right now because everything we're hearing and seeing, or a majority of it at least, um, like on YouTube and stuff like that that you said, is actually at the kind of site of the pipeline. So it's just it's really powerful because it kind of brings you to that site, you know? Yeah. I mean, we've never stood in North Dakota and we've never, you know, seen these lands at Standing Rock and maybe we don't understand how sacred the feeling must be there, but at least through social media and through different forms and media outlets, we've been able to connect with the story Yeah. and the landscape there. Throughout our research on No Dabble, um, one of the articles that we all came across was an article about um, you know the the police brutality that's occurring um, in, in the Standing Rock Reservation. And so you know they were doing a prayer service. The elders were doing a prayer service, um, and it was a sweat lodge. It was inside a sweat lodge, and um, police went into the sweat lodge and dragged some of the elders out. Um, and this is a case where like social positioning comes into context in the sense that like. The police officers would never walk into a Christian church and drag, you know, worshippers out of the service and say, you know, you're doing, the, the protesting that you're doing here is illegal and you need to leave. Um, but because they couldn't understand the sacred, the sacred nature of the sweat, um, the sweat lounge and like the prayers that they were doing, they violated their religious rights. And I think that that's something that's come up a lot in the things that we've been researching is the police um, on the ground there and how they're violating a lot of the uh, Native Americans' rights and beliefs. Yeah, like I know there was another instance in which two of the police officers that were kind of working the jurisdiction that this falls into actually ended up quitting because of the police brutality that had been happening, like the water cannings um, and hundreds of people had hypothermia and then they used uh, rubber bullets in their guns but at really dangerous ranges and someone's arm was actually amputated. So just things like that, like there are horrible things happening and I think it all plays into kind of power relations that exist, and then those power relations allow people to form the kind of social constraints um, of like, is this a religion, is it not? And because the police have the power in this situation, uh, through violence mostly, they're able to kind of go into the sweat lodge that you were talking about, and because they, they don't respect it to the same extent that they would kind of the Abrahamic religions, mm -hmm. they disregard that point of view and just go ahead and pull the worshippers out, which, like you said, would never happen in yeah. a, a Christian religion. Yeah, and so, you know, the constructing social realities through politics and through power relations is something that we talked about a lot in this class, and obviously in this power relation, the police are, you know, forcing their social reality and their social positioning onto the Native Americans and the protesters there in a very brutal and unfair way. Definitely. A lot of the material that we've covered through the course of this year has made me think about empathy, because a lot of times there are things that I'm not familiar with, like the religious practices that people have, the rituals they follow, their beliefs. They're just things that I've never been introduced to before. So at the beginning of the year, it was really hard for me to kind of reconcile with what they were saying, for me to understand them on that level. But as we kind of went through the readings, I learned to adjust my frame of mind to kind of be more open to what they were saying. And maybe I don't have to 100% agree that they're right and I'm wrong, or that I'm right and they're wrong. I think there's a nice middle ground there. And through this, through that kind of mindset, looking at the dapple, it's been really helpful because I can understand that, hey, maybe the Native Americans aren't 100% right, 
and the corporations, the companies aren't 100% right, there might be a middle ground there. So I think I've learned through the course of this year that there are always two sides to a story and you have to evaluate both sides to get a greater picture. So I think um, this project and also throughout the course of Anthropology of Religion, we stop and think about how we make sense of these things with the things that we've learned. And so I think with this issue of No Dabble, I'm learning that you know, there's not going to always be an answer to this and the perspective that I identify with might not be the right perspective. Um, and I think it's hard to know what's right in this sense. But for me, at the end of the day, if there are human rights being violated, if there's sacred, if there's something that you hold sacred being violated, then it's wrong. Um, and maybe that's a very black and white perspective to have, but I think in making sense of this, um, you know, this landscape is sacred. This is something that we've learned throughout the course. And whether somebody feels that it's sacred or not doesn't give them the right to violate it and to violate the people that live there or that value it in that way. So for me, I very much support No Dapple and I think that all of the people who have stood up and protested have done a great job of standing up for people's right to religion, their right to believe what they want, their right to fight for what they believe, and their right to believe that land, water, and landscapes are sacred. Uh, throughout the course of this semester, uh, this class, I feel like I've learned just how to respect the culture and, uh, you know, how, how to stay loyal, um, you know, to a culture where you believe in. And I feel like, you know, if if you allow an act to be settled and, and it goes into effect, don't renege on a, a people and, a, you know, a culture and a society that has been here uh, previous, you know, to your establishment here. And uh, I just feel like... Uh, a lot of things have been bounced, you know, whether it's been culture and influence on how to run a government and uh, things like that. And referring to the billiard ball thing that we talked about this semester uh, with the Native Americans, I feel like, yeah, we, they've been, been inspired to change, you know, the way that they reacted with our culture and, you know, you know, to participate uh, and cooperate, you know, with one another. But uh, I just feel like they were, you know, just really mistreated with this situation and um, like I said, I don't, I don't know if my, my decision to, uh, to, you know, going for the Native Americans is not necessarily right decision, but uh, I'm for No Dapple and I support anybody who is for it. Throughout this course, we've been introduced to a lot of different cultures that are totally different from one another. And I think the No Dapple movement is a great uh, example of a cause that is bigger than the society that we kind of live in in our daily lives um, where we focus on um, our apartments, our fuel, our um, just kind of necessities which are totally different to a culture such as this where they're focused on actually just the purity of their water and their spiritual connections to the land. Um, so this kind of takes you back to the roots and just something broader and bigger than ourselves and our normal society or what we call normal um, is totally different for another culture. So I think that just kind of opened my eyes um, and is a great example of a lot of the stuff that we've been learning throughout the course. And I support No Devil and the Native Americans.